So in this video, I want to talk about some race denialism that recently occurred in the journal called Science. The article in question is called Getting Genetic Ancestry Right for Science and Society. It has a very large number of authors. So early in the article, they write that, quote, how we classify people by race is a product of historically contingent social, economic, and political processes. For example, in the U.S., immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were only put into the category white on the census during the 20th century. American Indian and Alaskan Native peoples are defined socio-politically. As such, social scientists and others have argued that the strongest case for using race is best limited to tracking the impact of racism on health outcomes rather than as a proxy for anything biological. Now there are two things broadly speaking to say about this. In the first place, assuming that they were correct about the facts, this conclusion would very obviously not follow. So imagine that for, quote, socio-political reasons, I started talking about a group of people comprised of people in a certain area of France and a bordering area of Germany. And it's a group of people that have never before been considered in any sense a kind of unified group. And I argued that certain genes had a higher than average frequency in these groups and that these genes explained some outcome difference between these people and the other peoples in France and Germany. And again, imagine I'm doing this explicitly uh, for political reasons. The fact that I'm doing it for political reasons, or the fact that I've invented a new category that wasn't used in previous centuries, none of that has anything to do at all with the degree to which that category actually is or is not a proxy for something that is biological. It could be or it could not be. Talking about the motivations behind the creation of the category or the reasons for emphasizing it is a fine conversation to have, but that has nothing to do with whether or not there just are objective biological differences between the groups uh, that I've constructed. Now, like I said, that point can be made taking for granted that they got the facts correct, uh, but they didn't, and they didn't even try to substantiate some of them in a remotely serious way. So the first claim they made is that in the U.S., immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe were only put into the category white on the census during the 20th century. And they say reference to substantiates that. Now, reference to, as it turns out, is a entire book. There's no way to know what page this claim is supposed to be on. It's a book for a popular audience, so it's obviously not even the primary source. The point of a citation is supposed to be so that someone can check the validity of a claim, and this makes it very inconvenient to check the validity of that claim. And as a result, like I said, I wouldn't consider this to be a serious uh, citation. Now, that being said, I downloaded this book, uh, a free version, I should say, and I searched for all the instances of the words uh, census and Italian in it, looked at all the sentences in which those words occurred, and I couldn't find any that were obviously making this claim. But in any case, of course, uh, the census is a public document, and we don't need to go to a book to find out what census documents were like in the past. So we have from Pew here, we can see that in 1900, the racial categories on the census were white, black, Indian, Chinese, and Japanese. In 1850, they were white, black, mulatto, black slave, and mulatto slave. And in 1800, they were free white males or free white females, all other free persons and slaves. Now, at no point was there a special category for Southern Europeans or Eastern Europeans or the Irish. You hear that mentioned sometimes. We can look here at an actual picture of a census form from 1850. And if you look right above the number six, it is that the sixth question is asking you about your color. Indeed, there's an option for white, but there's no option for Italian. So... This is just not how the census has ever worked. I also want to mention a book called White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race. The book concerns the fact that beginning in the 18th century in the United States, so very early, there was a law stating that in order for an immigrant to become a naturalized citizen, they had to be white. And so that led to a bunch of legal challenges having to do with people claiming to be white that the government said was not white. And we can look at this table at the end of the book, which summarizes all of the cases, beginning in 1878. And what we see is that in no case was a European person declared not white. And we can see here where the author is quoting another historian that, quote, every European immigrant group, regardless of national origin, had the right of naturalization. Meaning that legally, 
the federal government consider them to be white. I also want to mention very briefly here, and we'll talk a little bit more about intermarriage in a second, but here I want to mention this paper on intermarriage rates in 1880, which found that Irish Americans had intermarriage rates with native whites, that is Irish immigrants did, at a rate similar to, say, Germans, for instance. And that's notable because, of course, interracial marriage was against the law in most of the United States at this time. And so we can see there are several different legal contexts in which clearly these groups were considered white going well into the 19th century and, I mean, more fundamentally, just literally always, as long as people have talked about white people. Most people have included groups like Italians or Slavs in that grouping. Now, returning to their paragraph, we see the next claim they make is American Indian and Alaska Native peoples are defined sociopolitically. Their citation for this is this article, which has to do with the political reasons for which the misclassification of Native Americans has occurred. These reasons are summarized in this table. This has to do with things like, for instance, the federal government not recognizing certain tribes for land for reservation unless they entered into certain legal deals with the government. It also talks about how tribes themselves have changed the ancestry requirement and even the genetic requirement for membership of those tribes. But of course, the very idea of misclassification presumes that there's a correct classification and implicit in the article's own narrative is that the correct classification is rooted fundamentally in ancestry, which is to say evolution, which is to say biology. Now, this article does say at one point that, quote, during the 19th century, race presumed shared biological or genetic traits and was thought to be linked to intelligence, health, and personality. Race as a demographic category is being used widely in contemporary research contexts for demographic purposes, but historically race and race categorization were used for much more damaging purposes. The one-drop rule dictated state policy regarding treatment of people of African ancestry and other minorities under the Racial Integrity Act, effectively promoting a pro-eugenics agenda in the state of Virginia. Although laws prohibiting interracial marriage had existed throughout the continent since the colonial era, it is now widely accepted that race is socially constructed and reflects the scientific and socio-political climate from which it originated to describe biology. Now, I think this statement is worded in a way that gets to what I said earlier, which is, you know, they say that race is a socially constructed term reflecting the scientific and political climate from which it originated to describe biology. So a term can originate for political reasons, but still, in fact, describe something which is fundamentally biological. And before I move on, I just want to make clear, I'm not saying that the article they cited agrees with the narrative I'm saying. I'm just saying that this is the correct narrative to draw from what they actually talk about. I do want to look for a minute, though, at this Racial Integrity Act of 1924 because it, it illuminates some things uh, even further. And so the act creates a form to record someone's racial ancestry, and they divide race into the Caucasians, Negroes, Mongoloids, American Indians, Asiatic Indians, and Malays. And the act makes a very explicit quote for the purpose of this act, the term white person shall apply only to the person who has no trace whatsoever of any blood other than Caucasian. And it goes on to the so-called Pocahontas Amendment, but persons who have one-sixteenth or less the blood of the American Indian and have no other non-Caucasic blood shall be deemed to be white persons. Now, a few things to be said in the first place. Again, there's no exception here for Italians or Poles or whatever. And then in the second place, we see a politically motivated move here, right? This Pocahontas Amendment, everyone recognizes, is a politically motivated change or oddity in this legal definition. But the whole reason we can recognize that is against the backdrop of the fact that the common sense definition used at that time was this exact definition without that exception. Returning to the article in Science, they write that, quote, attempts to isolate possible biological contributions to race-based health disparities using the percentage of a particular continental ancestry category risks circularity. This is because if the continental ancestry categories correlate with race, they also correlate with racism and other non-biological factors. So one thing to note is that this isn't circular, that's just not what that word means. 
And then in the second place, there's no rule in science, especially not health science, which is the context they're talking about this in, which says that you can't use a variable if that variable is confounded by another variable. The normal approach would then be to try to control for that variable that is confounded by. And then lastly, we can note the obvious political motivation behind this. This is completely insane. If this was true, then by the exact same reasoning, you could never measure the effects of racism because after all, it correlates with continental ancestry or the experience of racism does. And just to make this uh, concrete rather than purely theoretical, I'm going to talk about this paper from last year, and it's looking at the relationship between continental racial ancestry on the one hand and cognitive ability on the other. And it includes in the set of variables it controls for very standard things like parental socioeconomic status, but also the data set included a state level indicator of racism having to do with the mean level of implicit bias against different groups in that state and measures of state level structural discrimination and also a questionnaire about personal experience of discrimination in a variety of contexts and what it found is that after controlling for skin color socioeconomic status personal experience with discrimination and state level of racism that continental ancestry still significantly predicted cognitive ability in the sample of American adolescents. And in the direction you would expect, so for instance, after controlling for all of those things, African ancestry was still strongly negatively correlated with cognitive ability. Now it's worth mentioning that the association between African ancestry and lower cognitive ability was greatly diminished, although it still existed, uh, when you controlled for a set of gene variants which are known to predict cognitive ability within racial groups. And that suggests, of course, that a lack of some of these cognitively enhancing gene variants partially explains uh, the association between African ancestry and lower cognitive ability. And it should be noted that these gene variants only account for a small proportion of the total number of gene variants uh, which impact intelligence. And so this shouldn't be thought of as a measure of the total genetic contribution to racial IQ differences. The study found that the polygenic score based on these gene variants correlated at 0.51 with general intelligence, but also at negative 0.13 with state racism, negative 0.24 with self-perceived discrimination, and negative 0.56 with skin color. And so controlling for these variables is likely partially controlling for genetic differences in intelligence, because the kind of people who tend to perceive themselves to be victims of lots of discrimination tend to have a fairly low genotypic IQ, as it turns out. Returning to our friends in the Science Journal, they write that there are many statistical methodologies across subfields of genetics and genomics whose outputs are framed as genetic ancestry. Some of these attempts to approximate the subset of paths through a family tree via which DNA has been inherited but many do not even attempt to do this and are better thought of as estimates of genetic similarity between individuals in a data set rather than genetic ancestry. Now this is a statement which is so incredibly stupid, I read this many times to make sure that they actually said what they just said. It is literally high school tier biology that genetic similarity is a measure of ancestry. That for instance, because you descend from your parents, your genome is quite similar to theirs. And that more broadly, when you look at the evolution of populations, that a population and the members of a population will end up being quite genetically similar to each other relative to members of other populations due to ancestry, especially in neutral gene variants and the like that don't lead to differences that are under the influence of natural selection. And so you won't be picking up on similarity due to involving in similar environments, but you really will be measuring ancestry. And we'll see in a minute, I mean, this paper itself goes on to then legitimize analyses which measure ancestry via exactly these methods. I mean, this is just, this is just an insane, retarded thing. This, I don't know, there's nothing even to say, this is just crazy. This is just totally insane. I have no idea why this is in the paper. They then complain about a certain kind of analysis, they say that if individuals from the most commonly used reference populations are graphed, distinct clusters emerge, 
And they say, indeed, a prominent early result was the genetic ancestry, remarkably, uh, was very concordant with self-identified continental ancestry. But if people are sampled differently, such as individuals from New York City, it becomes clear how impoverished this view of a structure of distinct clusters is. And so we can see here what they're talking about. So we have a graph, PC2 and PC1 are the two axes. Those are principal components of genetic covariance. The meaning of them basically is that you can think of each one as a kind of index of a set of gene variants which tend to go together. And the reason they tend to go together is because of a shared ancestry. But anyway, each one is this index that captures some degree of uh, the genetic differences between people. And notice how somehow, even though according to them, just like one page ago, this kind of analysis cannot be used to determine ancestry, in the first place, people from distinct parts of the world are appearing on different places on this chart. And then in the second place, flooding this chart with people from New York, I mean, this is very stupid uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, one reason is that they have 4,000 people from 87 populations from around the world and then 31,000 people from New York, which is to say that this is an insane, like this has nothing to do with what the world looks like. If it was a representative sample of the genetic variants in the world, then almost all the data would come from reasonably isolated populations, and you would have a very small number of these very mixed individuals. New York is not what the globe looks like. Pretending that this chart represents a human genetic variation is, I mean, it's just crazy. So th that's really the first point I want to make. We can look at this paper from 2015. And it's important because it does a similar kind of analysis, but on a representative sample of the United States. Now, the United States is remarkably racially diverse, much more so than most countries. And what we can see is that even with these groups kind of bleeding together on this chart, it was still true that you could predict the self-identified race of white people, black people, and East Asians well over 90% of the time, and over 99% of the time in the case of white and black people. And we can see, for instance, in the room panel of this chart, that there were more multiracial people in this data set than there were East, A than there were East Asians. But that didn't stop them from being able to predict who was East Asian. So that the existence of multiracial people does not in any way invalidate the existence of people who are overwhelmingly one race or the other. And this is just super obvious, right? If you had a room with one black person and 20 mulattoes, well, there's still one black person and 20 mulattoes. That's just how it is. I should also mention, and for this, I'm going to use a graph from this blog you see here, which I recommend taking a look at. But the blog makes the simple point that before we were looking at a chart with two principal components, you could add a third, you could add many. You could add many more than three. The more you added, the more predictive we would get. And of course, as companies like 23andMe have shown, at a sufficient level of genetic resolution, you can begin to break apart ethnic groups at a much lower level of aggregation than major races. Another obvious thing to say about this is that it commits the so-called continuum fallacy. And what it comes down to is the fact that we can create categories over perfectly continuous variation where things bleed into each other. Colors are an example often given. Fun example of this is the idea is that of someone having an enlarged organ, say an enlarged heart. You have a doctor treating people with enlarged hearts, and then some retard from science comes in and says, hey, don't you know there are lots of people with heart sizes in between, and in fact, at every possible value in between what you call an enlarged heart and a normal-sized heart, and whether or not you say someone has an enlarged heart will determine whether or not you treat them, in, they're treated in certain ways in the medical system, and so it has socio-political ramifications, and they go on and say all these things, and in their deluded, sick mind, they think that this somehow stops there from being biological differences between the people we call those with enlarged hearts and those without enlarged hearts. Obviously, that is just very, very stupid. Now, I also want to note that this article continues a long tradition of talking about the concept of race in biology in a way that is totally divorced from the traditional concept of race in biology. What they're presenting here is the idea that it would be a problem for the idea of race in biology if there were lots of mixed individuals that sort of existed in between, genetically speaking, the major racial group categories, not just halfway in between, but also, you know, at every 
99%, the 98%, the 97%, etc., all the way down. And this is a completely ahistorical. So we can go to Joan Blumenbach, who is often considered the founder of disciplines like zoology and anthropology. And we can go to him writing in the 18th century, and he says, quote, Speaking of varieties of mankind, No variety exists, whether of color, continents, or stature, etc., so singular as to not be connected with others of the same kind by such an imperceptible transition that it is very clear they are all related. So, again, he's talking about an imperceptible transition across varieties of mankind. We can also look at a writer like Buffon from an even earlier generation of biologists, also considered one of the very sort of mean race scientists of the past. And he writes, quote, We find that mankind descends by imperceptible degrees from the most enlightened and polished nations to people of less genius and industry. So again, a dissension by imperceptible degrees. Returning to Blumenbach, he writes, in terms of the characteristics by which we can differentiate groups, he says, first, on account of the multifarious diversity of the characters, according to their degree, one or two alone are not sufficient, but we must take several joined together. And that this union of characters is not so constant, but what is liable to innumerable exceptions in all and singular of these varieties. Still, this enumeration is so conceived as to give a sufficiently plain and perspicuous notion of them in general. So, when you're talking about the biological markers of race, you must use many, and even using many, these are generalities, which will have exceptions. Now, in fact, today, I think we would have to amend this a little bit, because if you use enough genetic data, there are no exceptions. You can predict race with 100% accuracy, but... Obviously, this still rings true for most analyses that are going to be done most of the time. And the point here, then, is that the errors they're making in thinking that race is inconsistent with mixed populations or continuous genetic variation or basing the description of race on an insufficient number of physical characteristics, these are all mistakes which could have been avoided if science hadn't regressed to such an incredible degree that we now have a worse understanding of race among most contemporary biologists and anthropologists than was had in the 18th fucking century. And finally, we get to a part that is supposed to be the third problem with using race, and it rings like a satire of bad postmodernism. They write, The use of continental ancestry categories oversimplifies complex human history into a snapshot. There is no one answer to what is my ancestry, because the answer depends on the time horizon. And they say, for example, 50,000 years ago, Homo sapiens and Neanderthal categories, or 5,000 years ago, steppe-related European hunter-gatherer and Near Eastern farmer categories, 500 years ago, waves of migration and slave traits, again, and you go back far enough and we were all fish. Okay. That has nothing to do with the fact that there are groups of people, who we call black people for instance, who descend from people in a time frame that we're all familiar with, who were in Africa during that time period, and that's why they're called black, and this is a category, again, based on who they are descended from, aka the lineage, aka evolution, which is biology. This kind of reasoning would inhibit us from literally ever using in all of biology any ancestral category ever. And this has nothing to do, again, with any traditional concept of race. Everyone's always understood that it refers to a specific time frame. If that wasn't true, then, for instance, bringing a black person to America would turn them into a Native American. After, what, a generation or so, right? If it was just, who was your most recent ancestor or something? So to summarize... uh, Racial categories have been more stable than race denialists often imply, and while race has been given legal definitions for political reasons at times, and this does nothing to delegitimize the biological differences between ancestry groups. So far as it's been studied, racism does not explain the relationship between racial ancestry and important phenotypes like cognitive ability, and the continuous nature of human variation has long been known, as is the existence of mixed-race individuals, and this is consistent with large racial groupings most people can be assigned to on the basis of a sufficient number of biological markers. So that's the video. 
consider liking or commenting if you enjoyed it. And in any case, thanks for watching.